work? Yeah. All right. Turn with me to the book of Genesis. The book of Genesis 29. Genesis 29. Uh, I, I love. Uh, I, I love what uh, Bishop Tony said, and uh, yeah, when I when I knew he was going to be here, also, I mean, Bishop Tony and I, we've been doing a conference in Dallas area together since 2000, so I've known him for a lot of years. Uh, a man who is my apostle is on his board, and uh, they've, anyway, kind of the whole same stream and flow, guys. And uh, Bishop Tony's a great man, yeah, and uh, man, I love him. And uh, believe him. Genesis 29, starting in verse number 18. Very familiar story. Now, Jacob loved Rachel, so he said, I will serve you seven years for Rachel, your younger daughter. And Laban said, It is better that I give her to you than that I should give her to another man. Stay here with me. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed only like a few days to him because of the love he had for her. Then Jacob said to Laban, Give me my wife, for my days are fulfilled, that I may go into her. And Laban gathered together all the men of the place and made a feast. And it came to pass in the evening that he took Leah, his daughter, and brought her to Jacob, and he went into her. And Laban gave his maid Zilpah to his daughter, Leah, as a maid. And it came to pass in the morning that behold, I mean, no, that's a big behold right there. <laughs> behold, it was Leah. And he said to Laban, what is this you have done to me? Was it not for Rachel that I served you? Why then have you deceived me? And Laban said, it must not be done so in our country to give the younger before the firstborn, fulfill her week. And we will give you this one also for the service, which you will serve with me still another seven years. Then Jacob did so, fulfilled her week, and he gave him his daughter Rachel as a wife also. But it started in verse 16 by saying this. Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the elder was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. And Leah's eyes were delicate. Everybody say delicate. delicate. But Rachel was beautiful of form and appearance. Now, I, I am, allow me to lay just kind of a little bit of foundation with you to kind of let you know where I'm coming from in this. Um, as, as those of you that were here yesterday would have heard uh, Bishop Miller talk about, uh, I'm sure he talked a little bit about the difference between eisegesis and exegesis, that eisegesis is when you read into the scripture something you want it to mean. That's, that's most of the end time people, but anyway, I'm going to behave myself. Uh, rather than reading out of scripture what's clearly there in context. Because you need to understand something, that every one of us in here, the Bible was not written to any of us. It was written for us. Historically, the scripture was written to a specific people at a specific moment. The Bible is a historic book. Someone please say amen. amen. Listen, I'm telling you, there's a lot of folks don't really get that. Yeah. Now, because the word is alive, God can take what he said to someone else for us and make it alive and speak it to us. Yeah, right. Come on, you with me? But, but interpreting scripture, anytime you're reading the Bible, the, 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 the foundation must start it. It is finished. Uh, the, the, the foundation uh, the foundation must start in the un, in the understanding that we interpret from this side of the cross because God finished the works before the foundation of the world. He finished them before he started them. So you've got to go all the way back to the ending, which is actually all the way to the beginning. And you begin to see that amazing love of a father with a son who's desiring for a family. But we don't interpret the Bible from the old to the new. We interpret the Bible from the new looking back. Come on, you with me? Because you see, in the Old Testament, the law and the prophets spoke of Jesus. Or in other words, the law and the prophets spoke of a Christ, not an antichrist. The law and the prophets spoke of him. The sum of the book is all about him. Everything pointed, he is the word. It doesn't say in the beginning was the Bible. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. And then that word. So you can know the Bible and not know the word. That, 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 that's why they, Jesus said one day to the Pharisees, he said, you searched the scriptures to find eternal life and you couldn't find them in the scriptures because you knew the scriptures, but you didn't know the author. So you knew all about the book, but you didn't know the one that wrote it. So you won't understand the purpose of it. And so. On this side of the cross, if we interpret our Bible this way, then all we're focusing on is natural Jacob and natural Israel. How I many you know in the Old Testament it says that that how beautiful are the feet of him that brings good news? How I many you know the hymn is Jesus? But but now on this side of the cross, when that same verse is quoted, it says how beautiful are the feet of them. Wow. Amen. I mean, you know, the hymn has become a them. Come on, hello, them. Come on. 
The Old Testament was pointing to Jesus, but now we're not looking towards something. I'm telling you, the greatest revelation coming to the body of Christ is not what God's getting ready to do, but what he has already done. Because we're now looking back at what was finished. Because they were in the shadow of the old, heading towards the light. We are now in the light, and we look back at the shadow, and everything in the Old Covenant is Christ concealed. Everything in the New Covenant is Christ revealed. I remember 19, 1993 was the time where I first met my spiritual mother. Uh, she was a lady named Dr. Fuchsia Pickett. And my mother Pickett was probably one of the greatest teachers of the 20th century. Incredible woman of God. She had a great church, Fountain Gate Church in Plano, Texas. And I'll never forget, we're sitting at a restaurant. And she looked at me and she said, son, never forget this. She said, the words in red were written to Jews and not to Christians. She said, the new covenant did not start. Until it is finished. Yeah. Well, y'all still with me? Yeah. Now, it doesn't mean the words in red aren't important. It doesn't mean they're not applicable to us. Come on, help me somebody. Yeah. There's some people that teach you shouldn't pay attention to it all. I said, that's ridiculous. Because Jesus, was the incarnation, he was carrying the new covenant in his blood for heaven's yeah. sakes. Yeah. Come on, you with me? So it's still important, but I've got to look at the context of who is he speaking to. Let me, let me give you a couple examples. And Listen, if this is old hat to you, praise the Lord, I just don't want to assume. Is that okay? Yes. Yeah. You know, I know there's other churches represented here, too. I, I, I don't like to assume anything. When we look at the Lord's Prayer, first of all, how many of y'all realize the Lord never prayed that? Because can you imagine the Lord praying, forgive me for my trespasses? Yeah, come on. Come on. Have you ever thought of that before? I'm, just, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, there's a lot of times we read something like, oh. Well, I never thought of that. He would have never, he would have never asked the Father for bread because he was the bread. Yes. Uh, I mean, you know, that, that's more the disciples' prayer than it is the Lord's prayer. John 17 is more the Lord's prayer. But then you get to certain parts where Jesus said things like this. He said, He said, Father, uh, he said to his disciples, if you don't forgive men on earth, uh, then my Father in heaven will not forgive you. And, and to this day, my natural father, I, I'm, I'm a third generation preacher on one side of the family, second on the other. My mom and dad are getting ready this coming year to celebrate their 50th year of marriage and ministry. And they did. And, and I was raised wonderful mom and dad, but, but my mom and dad raised me in a lot of Pentecostal legalism. And my dad is still a human doing. He struggles with the message of the finished work. I think part of it is, is his pride can't admit that for the last 50 years he ain't really preached the gospel. Amen. And I'm not telling you anything that I ain't told him. All right. and, and, and we've gone round and round about it because he's still convinced that if him and my mom got in an argument and he got in the car and he went for a drive to cool off and he's upset and he didn't forgive her first and he got in an accident, he don't come, he don't pass go, he don't collect $200, he goes straight to hell. Still thinks that. And even though I sat down with him one day and I said, Dad, Jesus was speaking to Jews under the law, to a Jew under the law. It's true. If you don't forgive men, you're not forgiven because it was all about what you did. Then God would respond to you. Isn't it, isn't it interesting that in, in Deuteronomy 28, I mean, I just, this just hit me a, 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 a couple months ago. Deuteronomy 28, God declares all 613 laws, and then he begins to declare all the curses over each law. And after every curse, the, all millions of the Israelites, after every curse, they said, amen. So be it. But then he declares all the blessings and no amens. Uh, have you ever thought about that before? I mean, I mean, after every curse, they said, so be it. Because I'm convinced most men believe they're more worthy of the curse than they are the blessing. And rather than declaring amen over the blessing, it was like, no, no, as long as it was a curse, so be it, so be it, so be it, so be it, so be it. We deserve that. We're useless. We're a worm. We're a little miserable. Mm -hmm. And so it was always that response. But then when you go over to Ephesians 4, Paul says this. He says, forgive as you have already been forgiven. Amen. In other words, your forgiveness is not contingent on whether you forgive. Right. It's contingent on whether God in Christ already forgave you. So, so not, But now that you're forgiven, you should forgive because it's part of your nature. Amen. But if you get upset with your spouse and get in a car accident and die, I think the blood of Jesus is a little stronger to keep you in heaven. Come on, you with me? And then our favorite verse, boy, this one got me to the altar. This one got me saved at least a hundred times before I was ten. At least a hundred times. 
Matthew 7, many in that day will say, Lord, Lord. Because you know, man, the preachers would preach that one up really good. Get you to the altar. Many will say, Lord, Lord, they went out prophesied in your name and cast out devils and heal the sick and raise the dead. And I'll say, away from me. I never knew you. We're sitting there as a kid going, man. I'm lost as a goose, man. I, I ain't never going to make it, man. I mean, I can do all these miracles and then I still don't know me. And my whole relationship with God most of my life was, he loves me. He loves me not. He, he loves me. He loves me not. I'm in the kingdom, just got kicked out. I'm in the book, just got a race for giving Jesus back in. I, I mean, I mean, literally, I almost used to think there was an angel up in heaven, and he's erasing my name every time I sinned, and then when I'd say, forgive me, Jesus, he put it back. I mean, let's be honest, most of us have a hole in the page. <laughs> Because I'm a good mess. You'll see in just a minute. <laughs> and so one day I was actually reading that in light of what my spiritual mama taught me. And it dawned on me, uh, Jesus here isn't talking to any Christians. There weren't any Christians on the planet yet. Matter of fact, the context is he's talking to Jews. He's not only talking to Jews under the law, but he's referring, talking about false prophets. Look on your Bible. Under the heading it says false prophets because to a Jew, if you healed the sick, raised the dead, cast out devils, did all those things, then you were considered a great prophet. But Jesus says you'll know, that you'll know them by their fruit. And he's not even talking to anybody that is full of the Holy Ghost or born again yet because no one was born again yet because he hadn't gone to the cross yet. Come on, are you hearing me? So it don't have nothing to do with you and I. He'll never look at you and say, away from me, I never knew you. He knows us by name. Ridiculous to try to put that scripture on someone that has received the shed blood of Jesus. Doesn't apply on any level. Good teaching, brother. Huh? Now, mind, now watch. Every time I see Jacob... And, and I study Jacob or Israel, I automatically I shift into this mindset, understanding that I'm interpreting from here, looking back there, because Paul says that we now, the true Jew, is the one born from above. Amen. That the spiritual Israel is the church. Amen. And so if you study natural Israel, and, 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 and let me just... Lord, I don't want to get in all kinds of trouble. Let me just say this. Listen, according to Galatians, it's never been about the natural Jew. Yeah. Ever. It's not replacement theology. There's nothing to replace. Okay. Writer of Hebrews says, he makes it real clear. He said they were the congregation in the wilderness. That's the word ecclesia. They were the church in the wilderness. The covenant was always given to those who applied it by faith. It's never been about natural DNA. Yeah. Ever. Because you know that when... When the, when the law was given on the mountain and they said, uh, so be it then to that law. Do you know that there were Egyptians, there were Ethiopians, there were people from all kinds. It wasn't just Israelites. And listen, it definitely wasn't just Jews because Jews only come from Judah. How many of you know that, that every Jew is an Israelite, but not all Israelites are Jews? Are y'all still here? Matter of fact, Paul put it like this. He, he, started, he said, I speak an allegory to you. And he likens natural Israel to Ishmael. And he likens, he likens Isaac to the church. Because it's always been about those who apply the covenant by faith. Because when natural Israel didn't apply it by faith, they went into slavery for hundreds of years. The covenant did not work for them just because they were born flesh and blood of Jacob. Come on, are you hearing me? It's always been about those who apply the covenant of God. It was always by faith. It's always been by faith. Amen. It doesn't mean that we don't love Israel. It doesn't mean we don't love Jews. Jesus loves them just as much as he loves you. Yeah. But guess what? We all need Jesus. Yeah. Ooh, good teaching, brother. Hallelujah. I got a, some of y'all got nervous. <laughs> I had someone try to tell me that one time. They said, well, brother, I'm sorry. I believe Israel was a, he was a Jew. I said, well, first of all, Israel had a Jew. Yeah. 
uh, by the name of Judah. Or, you know, <laughs> not, not not only that, but 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 his father Abraham wasn't a Jew. Abraham was an Iraqi. Abraham was a Babylonian that God gave a covenant to for heaven's sakes. Come on, look, I'm, I'm telling you, it amazes me that people don't know that. They're like, ooh, he was just always a Jew. No, he wasn't. He was a Babylonian who got a covenant. And he applied it by faith. And by faith, everything that began to manifest. And when they didn't apply it by faith, nothing happened. Come on, you with me? Same is true today. Now watch. Whenever I see Israel or Jacob, I pay close attention because I'm like, okay. Maybe this has something to do with us now also in the new covenant. That's why I love looking for Jesus back there. He's all over the old covenant. I love because the law and the prophets spoke of him. Him. Just keep your gospel crystal centric. And if you keep Christ in the focus, how, how many of you know that when you keep Christ in the focus of everything, you're good because on the cross, Christ was in the middle, and on one side was a thief, and the other side was a thief, and so if you go too far one way from Jesus, you're going to have something stolen from you. <laughs> huh? On either side of the cross is a thief, so you better, better just watch out going too far one way or too far the other. If you keep Jesus in the center, it's all good, man. <laughs> Just preach Jesus. He's easy to preach. Yes, now watch. We still doing all right? Yes. This story I love. Because it says that Laban has these two daughters. One of them is Rachel. She's fair hair. She's beautiful. And, 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 and Jacob falls head over heels in love with her. I mean, I mean so in love that seven years goes by like a few days. Amen. Listen, you know how crazy in love you got to be? For seven years to go by like a couple days. Seven years is a good long time. Amen. But just a few days. I, I mean, it's, it's like you know, my daughter and her husband right now, they're, they're still in the honeymoon stage. The honeymoon stage just is about 16 months. And actually, when you study it physiologically, that the honeymoon <laughs> stage is actually releases endorphins in your body and different stuff. There's still like an excitement. And my dad has said for years, he said, love is blind, but marriage is an eye-opener. Praise the <laughs> Lord. <It's> just... <laughs> it's like that first 12 months, 15 months, oh, everything's wonderful. And all of a sudden, you get to a certain month, and all of a sudden, you notice the toilet seat up, and the underwear is on the floor in the corner, and now you're just getting on my nerves. I, I don't just arrow you or phileo you. Now I got to agape you because I just want to choke you right now. <laughs> and I got to choose to love you with a God kind of love because you're getting on my nerves. I, I know none of y'all ever experienced that. You've been just beautiful relationship. <laughs> Then there's this other daughter, and her name is Leah. And the New King James, when I was reading, it says that her eyes were delicate. I think the King James says her eyes were weak. But when you study it in the original language, it gives a picture of a lazy eye, and a lot of Hebrew scholars for years have taught that she was cross-eyed. <laughs> She's a cross-eyed woman, and he's like, yeah, I don't want that one. You know? He's like, you know, I, I, I want Rachel. And so finally for seven years, I can almost see him sneaking out at night, walking down by the creek, talking, talking about the children they're going to have in the light. They're madly in love. And finally the big day comes, and it must have been quite a bash. Now, I know we don't like to think about our patriarchs like this, but... I, amen. Uh, you're going to find this... I, I, I preach in the hood most of the time, okay? So, yeah, I, all I know how to do is make it real plain. Uh, you, know, the, you know, the truth is, I guarantee he talked to Rachel enough to know her voice. Uh, but then uh, there must have been a big enough party that when that evening came, it just didn't matter to him. Like, cause, anyway, praise the Lord. <laughs> must have had a little bit too much to drink. I'm just saying. I'm, I'm, just, I'm not saying it's right. I'm just... <laughs> I'm just saying. And he wakes up the next morning. And rather than fair-haired Rachel, his desire of his heart, what he wanted, he's got Leah. <laughs> She's smiling at him saying, how you doing, baby? 
I said, for years, the world of this story is number one, thank God for electricity. <laughs> and this story is the reason why we pull the veil back nowadays and take a peek, because ain't nobody getting married by faith. I'm sorry. I want to see what I'm about to get into. I, I'm sorry, man. <laughs> Check this one out for myself. <laughs> then I, I also begin to realize that just like Jacob, a lot of us, that we've been serving God for seven years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, and we wake up one day and we look at our life and what's looking back at us. Is not what we expected. We thought uh, we thought our, our you know our marriage would look better, or maybe our kids wouldn't be as crazy. And, well, maybe we thought we'd have more money than we have now. We'd be further along. What we're looking at is not what we got in this thing for. But then there's another picture here that I think I think is amazing because you see, I, Rachel was what Jacob wanted, but Leah was God's will. And let me show you how. See, the promised seed of the Messiah did not come through Rachel. Right. Judah came out of Leah, and Jesus is called the Lion of the tribe of Judah. Yeah. The lineage of the Christ came through Leah. And, and, and man, when I began to study that several years ago, it hit me so strongly. And I was like, so God, he wanted Rachel. But Laban here was a picture of the Heavenly Father who wanted him to first fall in love. Now watch this. And when it hit me, it hit me so strong that he wanted Jacob. <laughs> Israel, a picture not for us in the new covenant, that we must become one with a vision that views everything through a cross. Praise God. That we, the church, become cross eyed. That we view everything through a finished work. Come on, y'all with me? That, that our vision, that we view people cross-eyed, that we, we view this world through a finished work, that, that we view through the glasses that God looks through. Yes. That we begin to perceive ourselves. What would happen if the body of Christ would get up every morning and look in the mirror? And they begin to see themselves in Christ. They begin to see themselves whole and complete and finished and healed and whole, delivered and set free. But rather than do that a lot of times, rather than be holding in a mirror is the glory of God being changed in that image from glory to glory. Normally we're looking straight on because we're just looking for our Rachels. And he's saying, I want you to become one with my vision. Amen. You see, something happens. Now, now listen, if, if you know someone who's physically cross-eyed, I'm not making fun of people. What you're about to see is that they have an incredible perspective of the kingdom that they didn't realize. That it's not a mean thing. It's not an ugly thing. The truth is, is that God's desire for us. You see, if, if, I, look at, if I look at Pastor Mark cross-eyed, it does something. First of all, when I look at him cross-eyed, I see two of them. I don't just see what he is, but what he can be. Yes, not, not, not only that, but if, if I focus long enough on crossing, no matter how hard I try, I can't focus on his issues. Because I'm trying to find his sin, and I'm trying to find his mess, I'm trying to find his issues, but no matter how hard I try, the more I look cross-eyed at him, I can't focus. Hallelujah. The Holy Spirit said to me, he said, what would happen if the body of Christ became cross-eyed? What if rather than walking around giving the world the finger, I preached a series years ago called Stop Giving Everybody the Finger, and the world gives a finger and it's offensive, this one's worse. Man. When we're pointing out everybody's issues and shame. And you get together with your family members who don't know Jesus and they're walking around with a cigarette and a beer and you're going, Stop it. Just stop that. It's not helping anybody. You're not going to reach them. Listen, Paul said to, in Corinthians, he said, We're not to judge those that are without, we're to judge those that are within. He says, What judgment begins in the house of God? Righteous judgments are declared in the house, not outside. It's not our, you can't legislate morality. You can't go scream at City Hall and try to reach it. Come on, man. You can't run around with picket signs. Christians love to picket. They just picket and scream at everybody, and then 
And then at the bottom of the sign, it said, God hates queers, and God, you're a murderer because you're going to the abortion clinic. And at the bottom, Jesus loves you. <laughs> it's like, really? I mean, do you actually think they see Jesus loves you? All they're hearing is yelling and screaming. And, and rather than looking at people through the cross, we judge them, we beat them down. We point the finger and then we wonder why they don't want to come to church. And they don't want nothing to do with church. Truth is, they're not, they don't have an issue with Jesus. Condé even said, he said, man, I would serve Jesus if it wasn't for all of his followers. <laughs> He's like, man, I, I call it Doobie Brothers mentality. Jesus is just all right with me. I mean, Jesus is cool. I just, I don't want nothing to do with them crazy church folk. Man. Mm-hmm. See, something happens, and, I, and then I begin to realize this. And the Lord began to speak to me, and he said, Has it ever dawned on you that the Father just might be cross And I was like, huh? And he's like, well, first of all, Jesus was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Isn't it interesting that when Adam and Eve ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, their sin did not keep God from them? Matter of fact, uh, for years I've had people say to me, I said, could you give me a definition of sin? You know what people love to tell you? They don't give you the biblical definition. They normally say separation from God. Uh, no, it, it's, it's missing the mark. And, and the mark is Jesus. So anytime you're not doing Jesus, you don't miss the mark. We're all mark missers. Come on, in one way or another, and you know, especially you, but anyway. No. <laughs> I couldn't help that. I was like, <laughs> it just fit with your name, man. <laughs> of all men, I'm a chief of sinners, Paul said. Right? <laughs> but see, what, what, what begins to happen then in our thinking is that, uh, you know, I was raised from the time I was a little boy. You know, sin, sin, sin. I tell people, raised in the, in the Pentecostal church, you know, I, man, I learned how to sin in the Pentecostal church. Well, we preached about it so much, it gave me some ideas. Never thought of it. I was like, if you never told me that, I never thought of that one. Now, that's a good one. Maybe I'll try that next week. I mean, I mean, everything. Sin, 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 sin. And the strength of sin is the law. So the more you preached on sin to me, the more it made me want to do it. And so right in, right in the right in the midst of all that, when you when you're when you're raised with that with that mindset, it's this idea that when Adam and Eve ate of the tree, that God was disgusted. He couldn't look on it, but yet it says God came down to walk with them. See, sin does not separate God from us. Sin separates us from God. Because Adam and Eve were hiding. God wasn't hiding. Sin brings you into fear and condemnation. And then you hide from him, but he never hides from you. Ever. He, he's not afraid of sin. That's why David said, you go to the highest heaven, God will chase you there. You make your bed in hell. He said, I ain't even afraid of hell, man. I've come all the way down into hell. You ever wondered why? Because he's cross-eyed. <laughs> now watch this. The Bible tells us in Hebrews that Jesus ever lives to make intercession for us. Now that is a litigating term. He's our heavenly lawyer seated at the right hand of majesty on high. And all he's doing day and night as our lawyer is reminding the father of what he did. Now, how many of you know if a lawyer's talking to a judge, the judge is always looking at the lawyer? And if the father is always, Jesus, day and night, is reminding daddy, daddy, I went to the earth and I got an A+. Plus. Daddy, I, I didn't just get an A, I got an A++++. Plus 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 plus. Daddy, I fulfilled the law completely. Daddy, Everything you said, Daddy, I declared it to Telestai. It is finished. It is completed. I did it. And Daddy's like just looking at his son the whole time saying, boy, woo, 
All he sees is the finished work. Yes. And no wonder Romans 4 says God is not imputing men's sins against them. No wonder he declared in 2 Corinthians 5, God who is no longer holding men's sins against them. Why? Because Jesus once and for all consumed all of that on himself at the cross. And once and for all, the Father now looks at the world. That's why contrary to a lot of TV preachers, he ain't mad. He ain't sending Ebola. By the way, to kill one Christian woman because of something President Obama did. Yeah, I'm sure God sent Ebola to kill that Christian girl. I mean, that sounds like God, doesn't that? I mean, come on. Listen, folks, if we think, I remember back, back in the... 90s and early part of this millennium, the preachers were up saying, Katrina, that was because of all the sin of New Orleans. I mean, my gosh, it, it barely even touched Bourbon Street. I mean, if you're going to clean New Orleans, you best start at Bourbon Street. I, I've been to Bourbon Street on an off night. And even an off night, I was like, I was blushing. I was like, Lord, have mercy. I was walking with a pastor. Anyway, praise the Lord. It scared me. I was like, what? Let's just hurry and get something to eat and get out of here. <laughs> and then people say, well, that, that Kristen that came a couple years ago, it came to clean Manhattan because of all the sin. And God came to sweep that Jersey Shore clean. I saw that show one time, those little perverts. <laughs> And listen, in the early 90s, I would have joined with them. Man, I'd have got up boldly and I would have declared if God doesn't judge America for our sin, he's going to have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. We all probably thought that way at one time or another. Sincerely wrong, but sincere. Rather than understand Rather than understand, I, I boldly declare now. Boldly have no problem declaring now. If, if, if God judges America for sin, he's got to apologize to Jesus. Not to Sodom and Gomorrah, because that means Jesus either bore all of his anger and all of his wrath at sin, or he didn't. Either Jesus took all of our judgment or he didn't. And, and, and some of y'all may have heard this before, but maybe some of you didn't. I, I'm telling you, well, one of the things hermeneutically that I've studied for years is wherever you see words in italics in the Bible. You know, a lot of the newer Bibles aren't showing the italics. That's not a good thing. Uh, where there's italics, it means it was added by translators. A, a great example is Romans 8, verse 1. There's there now for no condemnation of those who are in Christ Jesus. In italics. To those who walk in the spirit and not after the flesh. Because it, the truth is the original Greek just says there's no condemnation, period. And the translators say, well, that can't be, you know, it couldn't just be no condemnation. we got to add something. So you got to walk in the spirit. Not after the flesh. Okay, so we got to add something you got to do. Because it just couldn't be that good news. No, no watch. A great example is found in John chapter 12. John chapter 12. Jesus says this, I and mean, preachers use this in the middle of sermons all the time. As Jesus said, uh, if I be lifted up. The uh, word lifted up is actually translated uh, crucified. If I be crucified, I will draw all, and depending on your translation, it will say all men or it will say all people. But the word men or people is in italics. It means it was added by the translators. Because listen to this. If you believe, how many know Jesus was crucified? Come on, wave at me. He was crucified. All right, Jesus is saying, if I be crucified, I will draw all men. Now, if you believe it's men, then you've got a good case for universalism. All men means all men. That means everybody's going to be saved. Because he was crucified, and he said all men. Don't get nervous. I'm getting ready to go somewhere with it. <laughs> Pastor, who did you bring? This Yankee? Or is a Yankee down here? But see, the, the problem with it is this, is the word men is not in the original Greek. It literally says, I, even if I be crucified, I will draw all unto myself. So it's all what? Context. The verse before says this, now is the judgment of this world complete. And the prince of this world will be judged. And I, even if I be crucified, I will draw all 
judgment <laughs> unto myself. He's not talking about drawing all people. He's saying, I'm going to take all. I am the scapegoat, man. I'm the sacrificial lamb. I'm about to take all of your judgment on myself. Matter of fact, we quote it at funerals all the time. I, out of the book of Hebrews, it says it is appointed unto man. Notice it's not appointed unto men. Come on, that's very important. Because in God's mind, there's only ever been two men on the planet. There was a first man and there was a last man. How I many know when Jesus came to the earth, he doubled the population? Come on, because we were all born one man, Adam, with a many-membered body. And we get born again into the last Adam, Jesus, one man with a many-membered body. That's why how beautiful are the feet of him and now how beautiful are the feet of them. The him has become a them. He got more feet. That's why I said the works I've done show you doing greater works. It's not that we're going to do bigger stuff than him. There's just more of us. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, my God, watch. And we, we quote this at funerals all the time. It is appointed on a man once to die. After that, the judgment. We'll tell people. I'm going to get on this tomorrow night. We'll tell people, you know, when you stand before God on judgment day. I remember at seven years old thinking, <laughs> Of course, for some reason, no one, for some reason, no one read First John chapter four to me. Herein is love perfected, that you have no fear on judgment day, because we are as Jesus is. Now, the word you, know, I, I, I can't preach it. I got to wait till tomorrow night. Now, watch. It's very important. Is the point that a man wants to die after that the judgment? Then we don't read the rest of the verse. He goes on to say, even so, Christ died. In other words, your judgment is not in your future. <sighs> Your judgment happened 2,000 years ago. The good news is you and I, as his sons and daughters, we have no fear to stand before God on judgment day because perfect love removes all fear. Don't have to be afraid. That's why that little verse is real odd in there, because we are as he is. One translation says we're identical to Jesus, because if God judges you for all your mess, he's got to judge Jesus all over again, and he ain't doing that. Right. Woo! Good teaching, brother. Hallelujah. Huh? Yeah. But you see, I think we, see, when I, when I was growing up in the, in the classical Pentecostal <laughs> church, I, it's like I had these, I mean, it's not that it was taught to me, but it was caught. You know, it, it was like if, if I would ever do something or go somewhere that was not a good place, which for me was movies. Yes. Amen. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Ridiculous. <laughs> and I remember when I went to my first movie, I snuck out of the house. I was 14 years old. And it was a Disney movie. <laughs> it didn't matter. I was still terrified. And I remember, it's like I stood up to the door, I bought the ticket, and I envisioned in my mind that God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Ghost jumped out and waited at the door. And then I went in, and I did my business, and when I come out, I said, Lord, please forgive me, and then he jumped back in. <laughs> now, we know that's ridiculous, because he never leaves us. And he never forsakes us, but, but it was almost, even though it wasn't taught that way, I felt that way, like, you know, he's just jumping in and jumping out, and he's jumping in and he's jumping out, just like he's writing my name and erasing it, writing my name and erasing it. <laughs> loves me, he loves me not. He loves me, he loves me not. I'm a son, I'm a bastard. Back to a son. Bastard. Son. Orphan. Just, I, I tell people, I was raised eternally insecure. <laughs> But people tell me, you preach eternal security? I said, no, I'm just telling you, I don't preach eternal insecurity. Yeah. <laughs> Man, I'm a son, and I ain't going to stop being a son for nobody. Right. Even when I'm in the pig pen, I'm still a son. Yeah. Yeah. Praise God. Now watch, because I love this. See, something, something begins to happen when we get a different picture. Now, now, some of you may have seen this example before, but man, I, we need to show because it's real. Uh, it's very good. Uh, Pastor, if you come here, man, if you'd, if you'd stand like right here and face this way, and you two help me out, would you? Uh, face Pastor this way, one, one in the front and one in the back. And some of you may have seen this before. I believe it's extremely important because it really helps us. An old covenant picture of this uh, that God shows us. You know, you get to be the high priest because, you know, you're the man here. Uh, yeah, I missed the mark. I should have had you the sinner over here. Tonight, you know? I can already tell him and I are going to get along just fine. 
And, and now, now listen, I, I don't know you, nothing personal, but you're, you're the sacrificial lamb. <laughs> Same thing, you know, you're the center man. Uh, you, you get to be the center. Now, listen, in the Old Testament, this is what would happen. Uh, the, the sinner would bring the lamb to the priest. Wouldn't bring the lamb to the priest. <laughs> and then and you'd back away. And the priest would examine the lamb. You know, he'd check the lamb over. And, you know, yeah, he'd make sure it's teeth and its ears. And, you know, he'd make sure that it was spotless. Because yeah. it needed to be a sweet. <laughs> He's hamming it up on us. Here. <laughs> now, watch how important this is. After the lamb was acceptable, the high priest would then say perfect or spotless. But I want you to notice this. He never examined the sinner. He only ever examined the lamb. In other words, if the lamb was acceptable, then the sinner was acceptable. In other words, it made the high priest because he couldn't see the sinner. Come on, you can sit down, guys. Couldn't see the sinner without seeing the lamb. And Jesus at the right hand of the Father constantly interceding on our behalf. All the Father's doing is looking at his son and he's got a big grin. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. He's like, I'm so proud of my boy. Look what my boy has done. And so all these people that want to say, no, God's up there. Listen, he's not Zeus with some big long beard. He's not a Janus face God, which was a Greek God that on one side he had a white smiley face and the other side he had an angry face and he constantly twist his head around. He Listen, he's not Molech that is waiting for sacrifices to kill our kids. I'm telling you, he's not the policeman in the rearview mirror that even when you're driving a speed limit and you got your seatbelt on, you still let off the gas because you got to be guilty of something. <laughs> That's the Jesus I was raised with. And the Jesus I was raised with is a different Jesus that I know today. The Jesus I know today is heart beats for this world. He's not the savior from the world. He's the savior of the world. Man, he declared, he declared just like the Jewish people, a Tikkun Olam. And a Tikkun Olam was a renovation of the earth. And he's still declaring that over the earth today. He didn't come to save us from the world. It was our favorite scripture when I was growing up was, come out and be ye separate. Of course, they never preached it in context that coming out was coming out of a religious, pharisaical system, not coming out of the world. The Great Commission is going into the world. And the church, rather than go into the world, we came and hid in church. We came and become clusters on the vine. And rather than being the new wine to the world that's thirsty for new wine, instead we sat in the house and screamed at the world to come to us, and they ain't coming. They're not coming because how we view them. Now let me whew, listen. What do you think would happen if we begin to look in the mirror every day and look at ourselves through the finished work? Insecurities begin to fall off the body. See, <clears throat> Lord showed me this a few years ago and it really helped me. And I'm I'm I'm, I'm starting to wind this down. Are right, we still doing all right? Yeah. I'm having fun. Yeah. Yeah. Praise the Lord. <laughs> 2 Corinthians 3, whenever Moses is read, a veil drops over men's hearts. In other words, the veil that Christ removed at the cross can be put back on. See, whenever you hear Moses preached, when the law is preached to you, it puts a veil back over your spirit. But anyone that turns to Christ, the veil is removed. And now we, beholding as in a mirror, are changed. Apocalypse. Same word for a revelation of Jesus Christ. We are changed. There's an, uh, an unveiling of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we are changed into that image from glory to glory. But now watch this. When I look in a mirror, whatever image I behold, I become. And what we're looking at is Jesus, who's not only our big brother, but he's also called our everlasting father. And so whatever vision we have of him determines how we will view ourselves. And you see, for a lot of us, when we think of God the Father, we can only relate it to natural fathers. So people that have had a good relationship with a natural father, they can look in the mirror and they, they maybe see the heavenly father smiling at them. But people that have had a 
horrible relationship with a natural father. When they look in the mirror, either there's no face at all because daddy wasn't there. Or the face that's looking at him. i got to be honest. And listen, my, my, my dad did an amazing job for where he came from. His parents were divorced when he was 11. And he had, he had no spiritual fathers. Never really a relation with his natural father until he was older. My dad did an amazing, amazing job for what was given to him. But my dad had all kinds of issues he hadn't dealt with from his daddy. And I'm not telling I'm a dad. We've had these discussions. I wouldn't tell you anything. I didn't talk to him. I honor my dad. He's a great man of God. But I, I, I had to come to the place because for years when I looked in the mirror, what I saw, you see, my dad at church was just loving and sweet. And he grabbed everybody and hugged them. Everybody's like, everybody in town loved Pastor Jim. And he's sweet. But then he'd get behind a wheel and he was full of road rage. <laughs> And he'd get home and yell and scream. And I mean, I mean, you know, one time he, you know, he grounded me for two weeks for taking a brownie out of the middle because I don't like crust. And so I took, I, I said to him, "What's the big deal? We're going to eat all the brownies anyway. I just, I, you know, I don't want a brownie off the corner. I want one out of the middle." And I'm mean, dead. Just lost it. And, and so for years, my view of Heavenly Father was this face. Yeah. <laughs> like, what's the matter with you? Dumb! Think! 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 Yeah. Or it was the look. <coughs> you know what I'm talking about. I'd be sitting in the front row of church and he'd be preaching all of a sudden. <laughs> I'd get that look. Every one of us, we know. You've either given the look or you've gotten the look before. And so rather than look in the mirror, rather than see, listen, even in the Old Testament, God said he'd cause his face to shine on us. Amen. He's never been in a pain. No, He's always been smiling, but we beheld him a certain way. Matter of fact, Paul even said it was in our minds that, that, that we, we comprehended him a certain way. It wasn't his real visage. It was his visage is marred because when we looked in the mirror, and we couldn't see daddy. Smiling because we didn't know how to look in the mirror cross-eyed. We couldn't view him in his finished work. And then see ourselves. Because the more I behold his image, I'm changed in that image. I now know who I am because I see who he is. Yes. But you see, if our picture of him is off, has everything to do with how we treat each other? has everything to do with how we see ourselves and then rather than act like sons, we act like orphans. And rather than, yes, Lord. Yes. <laughs> that actually happened to me one time. I never bring my phone in and I had it in my pocket and I was in the middle of a message and my phone rang. I said, excuse me, everybody. He answered it. I said, hello. It was a friend of mine from Tennessee. He said, hey. I said, hey, listen, man, I can't talk right now. I'm in the middle of a service. He said, you are not. So I said, say hello, everybody. Everybody shouted hello. Anyway, I figured we might as well go on ahead and go with it. <laughs> but no, watch. One of the things the Holy Spirit said to me a few years ago, and I should let it out. Reach this up one side and down the other to each other. I've used it to ordain people for more than 10 years now, and I never saw it this way. But Paul turned to Timothy one day and he said this. He said, study to show yourself approved unto God. God kept stopping me there. He said, read it again. Study to show yourself approved unto God. And he kept saying, I was like, Lord, what are you trying to tell me? He said, listen, study. To show yourself yes. approved yes. under God. Matter of fact, all of a sudden, I decided to check some other translations, and the NASB says, "Study in your approval." Well, that's good. That's good. And the Lord said to me, "He said, why is it that most of your studying for years has been on what disapproves and disqualifies people, rather than studying to show yourself approved?" <laughs> Under God, watch this, a workman who needs not be ashamed. Why? Because he took my shame. 
rightly dividing the word. And the Holy Spirit said to me, he said, how you know that you're rightly dividing the word is you're not looking for what disqualifies. You're looking at what qualifies people. You're not focusing on their issues because when you're looking cross eyed changes everything. See, when we started our church in Saginaw, one of the things God said to me, we started it on Sunday night for a reason. We don't have a Sunday morning service. I don't want to say never, but probably we never will. Partly because we're genuinely going after unchurched people. More than 40% of my church are first-time believers. And about another 30% are de-church, people that haven't been to church for years and they, you know, they got hurt and they decided to try church again. You know, or people, and the people that have come from other churches, you know, they just come and sit for a year and detox. <laughs> After our first year, I, I said I thought I was starting a church. I know it was starting a religious rehabilitation center. <laughs> it's amazing how long it takes to get all that stuff out of you. And I just realized, man, God's not mad at you. He's pretty happy with you. Crazy about you, man. And, and but what God began to send us is all kinds of gangbangers. I'm, I'm in boys with the drawers, you know, man. And I, I just wanted to walk up and just pull everybody's pants up. I mean, I even tried it one time. It's, have you ever just dropped your drawers down to here and tried to walk? I, I, listen, I don't, I don't get it. I mean, you know, you, I mean, it's like the most uncomfortable thing. I mean, I, I told a couple of boys, I'm like, no, you can't tell me, son, that that's comfortable. I tried it. It's miserable. <laughs> <laughs> but the Holy Spirit said to me, he said, I'm going to send you all kinds of people, and you're going to have to look at them. I'm going to send you people that no one else will know what to do with. And I'll never forget uh, our, our third service had a young man, and, and his name's James. James is my boy. James is my son. James is about 6'1", 340, big Hispanic kid. He's been on the street since he was nine. James had a rough life, big time. First time James came into our, came into our service, he was all bruised up because he'd been in a brawl in the streets. And, and James, three and a half years ago, was the biggest pot dealer uh, in Saginaw. And uh, walked in the building and got done afterwards. And our campus pastor, Gabriel, known him for years. He introduced me. And, and uh, I, get, I get around I get around big guys and I, I, I got to hit them. It, it's just, it, I, I'm just geared that way. I got a bunch of big old boys in my church. I mean, some big old boys. God sent them to me for one reason or another. And I mean, they're all packing too. <laughs> Don't worry about nobody coming in our church. <laughs> and when I'm gone, they know they watch my daughter, they watch my wife. I'm good. I, I know they're going to be taken care of. But anyway, <laughs> I hit him on the chest. Hey, big boy. How you doing, son? Doing all right. And I said, you know what, James? I said, I'm going to tell you something, man. God's got an incredible plan for your life, son. Not only that, you know that God's not even an ounce mad at you. He's going to prove uh, this destiny he's got for you. As a matter of fact, James, you know what? It doesn't matter what you did before this service, and it doesn't matter what you do directly after the service. God's not mad at you. And he just looked at me and said, are you hearing me? He said, man, that's hard for me to believe. That's what God's going to prove it to you. He's a guy. So he leaves. We're meeting in a basement hall at the time. About 10 minutes later, I walk up the steps to walk out the front door. And when I open the front door, I walk into a cloud of marijuana smoke. Because James is standing right at the front door smoking a blunt. And my, my first reaction was, Lord, you told me you were taking me higher this year, but this is ridiculous. <laughs> just told him, no matter what you do directly after this service, God's not mad at you. So I walked over and I put my arm around him. I said, James, I bet you got the munchies. <laughs> and he just looks at me. I said, let's go get something to eat. I'm buying it. And him and Pastor Gabe get in my car. We'll go down to a little steak place called Tony's Steak Sandwich Place. And, and he's sitting across the table and I'm talking to him and his eyes are bloodshot and he's eating a steak sandwich. And finally looks at me and says, Bishop, you for real? <laughs> I said, well, what do you mean, son? He's like, come on. 
He said, you know, every preacher in this town would have thrown me off the property or called the cops on me. You take me to eat because I got the munchies. <laughs> and I said to myself, well, well son, if, if I judge you for smoking something, then I got to tell the fat people they can't come to church. <laughs> well, I ain't no little guy saying this. Listen, that, 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 that means I got to tell all the self-righteous and all the prideful, the seven deadly sins, none of them have anything to do with smoking anything. It's all about your mouth and your attitude. I mean, I got to tell all those people they can't come to church either and he just looks at me and I said no I do want you to do me a favor he said what's that I said if you need to do this would you go around the corner of the building don't do it right at the front doors we have kids walking in and out he said yes sir <laughs> I found out two days later from his best friend he said to me he said you have no idea what your response did to him he said James at that time was like 24 when James was 18 he wanted to come back to God his mom was a little prayer warrior in a little Pentecostal church. And he called that pastor and he said, man, pastor, I've been on the street since I was nine. I've stabbed people. I've shot people. There's warrants out for my arrest. I mean, I mean, this kid had done everything. And the pastor said, well, can you meet me over at the church this afternoon? He said, yeah, I can get a ride over there. And when he got there, the pastor had cops waiting for him to take him to jail. Aww. I mean, didn't even give him the opportunity to turn himself in. And so I... I believe as much as anything, he was testing me to see how I would respond. But you see, I had a choice. I could look at him straight on and call the cops or kick him off the property. I could look at him cross-eyed and begin to see the potential that's in this young man. And I'm telling you, in the last three years, I've watched this young man's life change through affirmation. I've not told him one time, stop smoking that stuff. And you need to straighten yourself up. Every time I walk in, I walk up, I hit him in the chest. And I say, James, son, I'm proud of you. James, I believe in you, son. James, you're better than you think you are. You're better than you're acting. And son, I'm going to keep telling you who you are. You start acting like it. I'm going to keep talking to the Christ on the inside of you. I'm not preaching to, I'm not preaching to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I'm talking to Anari, Azariah, and Mishia. I'm not talking to the Simon in you. I'm calling the Peter. There's a rock steady person on the inside of you. I'm not looking at the Jacob lying, tricking, and deceiving. There's an Israel. There's a prince in you, son. And I'm going to keep calling that prince out because I can't rehabilitate Adam anyway. <laughs> A lot of what we've called church has just been prison. Yes. You know what prison is? It's a place you go because you broke the law. You've got to learn how to keep the law better. And you go there to get your behavior modified. That's that's called church. No, but Jesus. That's not the purpose for us to come and worship with the body of Christ. See, there's something that happens. Now, now, now. Man, I, I got I to gotta stop. And God's brought us one person after another that we've just had to look at him cross-eyed and watch God do the work. It's not my job to change anybody. It's not our, see, our problem is we've looked at the world the way we would look at him and we've not looked at him with Jesus' goggles on. That's true. And it's easy. The longer we're saved, you know, easy it is for self-righteousness to jump on us. That when we drive by a bar and someone's stumbling out drunk, rather than have compassion on them and pray for them, instead we almost, we look down our nose at them. When we see a girl at Walmart who's got hardly any clothes on, and we walk by, oh, that little harlot of Babylon. I mean, I mean you know, we, we look at, rather than have compassion, and say she probably never had a daddy teacher herself work. And rather than have compassion on the world, and much of the church just looks at him in disgust, and then we wonder why. We've not been reaching people because we, we don't even know how to look in the mirror and see ourselves. Because if we'd ever begin to look at ourselves cross-eyed, we'd stop looking at everybody else. That's right. The other way. Now watch this. Now see, I don't, I don't know. I don't know how polygamy works. Don't want to know. <laughs> You know, listen, I'm doing my best to keep one woman happy. <laughs> I, I, I know they said Solomon was the wisest man that ever lived, but, you know, 900,000 women, I don't see an ounce of wisdom in that. On the it, he must have got the wisdom after all that. <laughs> That's a crazy man right there. 900,000 women happy. Lord have mercy. Yeah, yeah. He was rich. <laughs> I had to be more than rich, but anyway. 
<laughs> now watch this. <laughs> Y'all are a mess in here. Just... <laughs> he still is given by Laban Rachel. So he's still given what is his desire, which is Rachel. And I'm sure, now again, I, I don't know if it was two different tents and, you know, he kind of went back and forth again. I, I don't know how that works. <laughs> You know, don't want to even try to figure that out, okay? All, all, all I do know is every time he got around Rachel, she was producing no fruit. But he'd get around Leah and she'd just smile at him. I mean, she'd give him that little cross-eyed grin and she'd popping babies out left and right. I mean, she's she bearing fruit like crazy, man. I mean, I mean, <laughs> I'm sure he's probably like, come on, God. But see, something began to happen, and I, I, mean, I, I wish I had time to unpack it. There'll be another time. But he had six sons with Leah before Rachel had one. The, the first son, Simeon, or Reuben. Reuben means seeing the sun. See, see, once you begin to see that what God has for you is best and not what you want. See, God's not against what we want. He just says, I, I, I have no problem giving you the desire of your heart. I just want you to fall in love with my purpose first. Fall in love with my eternal purpose, and then I, I'll give you the desire of your heart. I'm not against what you want. I just want you to fall in love with what I want. And I want you to put my kingdom first. My View everything through a cross and then they have Simeon. Simeon means hearing. That's not only you begin to see that what he has is best for you. You begin to hear it and you begin to believe it. Then they have Levi. Levi means join. Somewhere in there after that third son, he finally started to say, you know what? The longer I hang out with this woman, I'm beginning to be joined to her because I'm going to be know the more you hang out with someone, you become like them. And maybe after a while, the more he got around Leah, he started to look at her the way she looked at him. <laughs> and he began to realize that she ain't that bad. <laughs> Man, in fact, she looks pretty good the more I'm looking at it this way. <laughs> uh, see, man, I'll tell you, another thing that that screams is we're to know no man after the flesh. That man looks on the outward appearance. God. Yeah. Well, God looks on the heart. He's looking at you differently. He's not looking at your flesh. He's looking at the real you. Now watch, watch. Lord of mercy. And then have a son by the name of Judah. Judah means praise. Somewhere in there, he began to praise God for this woman. And he walks through the process. Now, God still gave him Joseph his dream, but he had to fall in love with God's dream first. And once he fell in love with God's dream, God let his dream become fruitful. I, I want to encourage you, if, if you're trying real hard at something and there's no fruit, either it's not time or it's not God. Hallelujah. Because see, when you're united with his purpose, it will bear fruit. Yes. It will, there will be an excitement with it. It won't be a drag. Right. Huh? Yeah. Doesn't mean it won't be work. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But, but, but doesn't mean there won't be tough times, but I can't wait to do it because right. it's just, there's an excitement to it. So something must have happened that he began to become so in love with Leah that then he has Joseph and his dream is born. But we know the story. Joseph is then the favored son and he's taken off into slavery in Egypt. And years go by and Jacob, now old Israel, thinking he would never see his son again, his boys come back from Egypt and say, Daddy, our brother, your son Joseph, he's the prince of Egypt, and he's got a place for us in Goshen. He's going to provide for us. Our family will be saved. And the father who thought he would never, ever see his son again, all of a sudden, a few years later, the old man is dim in the eyes. And Joseph walks in. Not only did he not think he'd never see Joseph, he'd never, ever dreamt 
of seeing Joseph's sons. And Joseph brings his two boys in front of the father. He brings the oldest one, Manasseh. Manasseh means made to be forgotten. He puts him at the father's right hand because that's the double portion, the hand of blessing. He puts the youngest son, Ephraim, at the father's left hand. And the protocol is he's supposed to lay hands on him like this. And Joseph must have got spiritual and closed his eyes or something because when he opened his eyes, he noticed his father went... <laughs> All of a sudden, his father crosses his arms. And he's like, no, 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 wait a minute, Daddy, you're doing it wrong. You're putting the right hand of blessing on the youngest son and the left hand on the older one. He said, son, first of all, what you don't know is I have so become one with a cross-eyed woman. I understand God's eternal purpose. And now I view every situation through the finished work. I view everything that comes in front of me through the cross and what Christ completed for us and as us. And, 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 and let me tell you something here, and Lord, Lord help me, Jesus, because I want to run off and preach for a while, but i got, I got to stop this. L listen, I'm telling you, at this moment, Jacob is a picture of the heavenly father in heaven because the father sent to this earth two sons. There was the first man, the first son, Adam, a picture of Manasseh, made to be forgotten, and God at the cross took the left hand of judgment, and he put it on Adam's head, and Adam was made to be forgotten. He took the right hand of blessing and he put it on Jesus the last man and the last man Ephraim is doubly fruitful and if any man be in Christ he's a new creation all things have pass away all things become new let me make a back to shout <laughs> and he said if you live if you live in this son and let, me, let, let me show you how I view everything how I view everything is this way. I'm going to put this hand of judgment and this hand of blessing, how it's interesting to me. And then, I don't know, if someone's going to come and play me a little something that will finally shut me up. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> a little mood music. <laughs> Get me a hearse. Now watch. Jacob leaves instructions. And he says this. He said, I, I want you to do something for me. He said, I want you to bury me when I die. You think he would have said, bury me with Rachel. The one that he loved. But instead he said, bury me with Leah. Bury me with that cross on me. Bury me, listen to this, in the same place. We're all buried. Because at that cross, when he was buried, we were buried with him. That's what people have said. I've heard people say for years, man, we don't know where Noah is buried or, or, or Moses is buried. Yes, we do. He's buried in the same place. All of us are buried. It's called in Christ. Because when he was crucified, we were crucified with him. When he was buried, we were buried with him. And now because of the finished work of the cross, now we can view ourselves differently. We view our neighbors differently. All of a sudden, we have compassion for people that we couldn't stand. For people that we would have thrown away just months ago. All of a sudden, there's this incredible compassionate heart. Let me tell you, when God begins to do that kind of work in you, it changes everything. the more I get a revelation of his ridiculous love and scandalous grace. I don't throw anybody away. I don't care what kind of stuff they're going through. Back here in March of this year, I was on my way to Colorado Springs to teach at the Bible school and I got, a, I got an upgrade to business class and I, I sit down on the plane next to a man and he immediately engages me and he says, hello, my name is. And the moment he started talking, I knew he'd been out of the closet for a while. You understand know what I'm talking about? He's like, hey, Eric, just. And he immediately starts talking to me, engaging. I talk back and two minutes into the conversation, he says, what do you do for a living? And I never tell anybody I'm a preacher, never. 
I don't even tell preachers I'm a preacher. Because I want to see how they're going to treat me before they know I got a title. Uh -huh. well, I, don't, I, don't, I introduce myself as Jamie. That's what my mama calls me. And so he said, what do you do for a living? I said, I troubleshoot for nonprofit corporations. <laughs> I do. <laughs> I'm not lying. It's my job. <laughs> and he's like, that's very interesting. How does that work? And we began to have this discussion. And about 15 minutes into it, he looked at me and he said, he said, you're a preacher, aren't you? I said, yes, sir. I don't lie about it. And he looked at me and he said, I don't believe you. I said, well, I am. He said, I'm sorry. I, I, I don't believe you're a preacher, let alone a Christian. And I said, sir, listen, I'm not lying to you. I said, why would you say that? And he looked at me and he said, because I've never been around a Christian, let alone a preacher, that I did not feel shame." condemned and judged. And he said, sir, I have not felt an ounce of that from you. Now watch. I looked at him. I began to cry. And I said, a couple years ago, you would have. I said, sir, the truth is, probably a couple years ago, the moment you said hello to me, I'd have just turned my head over and act like I was sleeping and I wanted to talk to you. And he said, well, what changed? And I said, I said, I, ha I had an experience with God in an airplane, 35,000 feet, with literally liquid agape pouring over me, and I wept for four hours. I thought I understood the love of God because I was raised in church singing, Jesus loves me, this I know. But I didn't understand it because the gospel that was given to me was a gospel of fear. And if love removes fear, then fear removes love. And I never knew how to love. And I began to talk to him about this love. And he began to just sit in the chair and just weep. For an hour we talked about the love of God. I never told him to repent, you filthy, rotten, little pervert. <laughs> You're on your way to hell in a handbasket. That's, that's, that's not my job. My job is to love unconditionally. It's to be Jesus. Jesus didn't love people Hoping that they would just convert. He was called a friend of sinners, which means they didn't all convert. Some of them stayed sinners, and he still loved them. And see, until we can get God's perspective on this world, then we're going to become modern-day Pharisees. Pharisee means separatists. We're going to have a mindset of us and them, those people. Those sinners those heathen and then wonder why they don't want to be our friend they don't want to have a relationship with us because I'm telling you if every church represented here would become so cross-eyed you want to fill your buildings up a couple times just start looking at people cross-eyed watch what God begins to do I mean, we filled our house up twice had to go start a whole other church now we're trying, to, we're trying to fill it up again why? Because people walk in and they're like, wait a minute, this doesn't feel like church. Thank you. I've had people come up to me. <laughs> I had one guy come up to me a couple weeks ago and on the way out I shook his hand and said, hey man, it's great having you here to enjoy it. He said, man, this church is the S-H-I-T. <laughs> he cussed right at the front door. And I was like, thank you, man. That's the best compliment I ever got. <laughs> He didn't say, well, brother, thouest, shouldest, not us, preachest what you preachest. <laughs> no, I didn't smack him and say, you're in the house of God. You shouldn't say stuff like that. I said, man, thanks, man. That was awesome. And I'm just, I'm just I was so honored to have you here today. Because, man, when you look at people that way, and you look at yourself that way, it changes Father, stand on your feet with me. Father, I thank you. I thank you for your amazing love for us. I thank you that that love truly, truly is scandalous. It is ridiculous. It, 
it makes no sense whatsoever. It's, it's better than we ever thought, dreamed, or imagined. Holy Spirit, I ask that tonight you, you anoint every one of us, anoint our eyes to perceive in a fresh way, in a new way. And we'll bless you for it, Father. In Jesus' name. Jesus name. I want you to do something with me. Would you, everybody, would you come on up here with me? I want us to pray something together. Come on, we're going to do something. I'm going to release a few things prophetically and we'll let you go tonight. And I'm going to go with Pastor and rev it up. Resting visit. Hallelujah. I thank y'all for letting me be me. I enjoyed that tonight. That's good stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. Mary Hart does good like medicine. It does. My wife told me for a long time now. She said, the older you get, the funnier you're getting. I'm like, is that a compliment? You know, funnier, funnier, you know. Sometimes both. It's just the mindset. I want you to do something. Would you just make a cross over your heart? So you gotta understand that the cross is more than just something we wear on our necks. Something we have on rings, something we have on earrings. It's more than something we have hanging on a wall. It is, it is, it is a perspective. It is a it is how we view everything. And because Jesus was the lamb, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, he's always looked at this world that way. Man, the problem is men don't know how to look at things that way. See, that's why Isaiah is a prophet of woe for five chapters. Woe. Whoa, whoa, because he's looking at everything that's going on in the earth. But all of a sudden, in chapter 6, he gets caught up into the heavens. And it's all of a sudden, he begins to declare the earth is full of glory. Because in the heavens, God's perspective is the earth is full of glory. Man's perspective is it's getting worse. It's getting worse. They've been watching too much MSNBC and CNN and Fox News. It's getting worse. Chicken Little, the sky is falling. <laughs> But I watch this. This is what's important. All of a sudden, the angels say, Who shall we send and who shall go for us? Who shall go to the earth to declare the message from the mercy seat? And Isaiah's response is, I'm a man of unclean lips. In other words, I don't know how to preach holy, holy, holy. I know I only know how to preach whoa, whoa, whoa. But now watch this. Man, I love this. The angels take a coal off the altar. What is a coal? When a fire is finished, listen, when a fire is finished, it leaves hot coals. The angels took a finished work and touched his lips and said, I want to change your message. Ma, ma, ma. I want you to change it from woe and sin, sin, sin to holy Holy, holy, the earth is full. Listen, the earth's not going to be full of glory. Matter of fact, the prophet said the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory. The earth is already full of glory. It just ain't got the knowledge. That's why it's our job to preach the gospel. To share the knowledge of the glory with people that God's crazy about you. His presence is already here. And when you worship and pray, you don't get in his presence. You just become aware of what's always there. Because his glory is always here. So pray this with me out loud. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for the cross, for the finished work. I receive it. I apply it to my life. I thank you today. Help me to be cross-eyed. Help me to see myself the way you see me. Help me to see others the way that you see them. Transform me by your precious blood and help me to see the way that you see. I thank you for that, Father. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Come on, now just lift your hands and love on them for a moment. Would you, Father, we bless you tonight. Father, we magnify you tonight. I thank you for your amazing love and your amazing goodness. Father, in us and through us, over us, on us, around us. Lord, transform our perception tonight. 
Father, I speak life right now over every individual, and I ask that you anoint their eyes. Father, I, I declare anointing, a fresh eye salve over every eye in this place to perceive spiritually, to see how you see. That we can see your perspective. We can see how you think about others, how you think about us, Father. We, we release that grace. We release that goodness, Father, in the name of Jesus. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for that, Father.